Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. It's so good to be with all of you this morning here at Racine Community Church. Pastor Dave and I were talking about uh, this morning, the closest thing that we have to a secret handshake around here is, I'm going to say, he is risen, and you all will reply, he is risen indeed. That's something we get to do together this morning. So, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Would you stand and worship with us? A torrent of destruction here, my darkened soul from rescue. I cried to God for help, He heard my voice. The tainted earth that rocked and reeled, the heavens bowed, the mountains near, the thunderous voice of God, my covering. Yeah. 
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't That makes no sense So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So I Thy faithfulness 
that we come into this place once again celebrating your resurrection. Sin and death will not have the final word. You will. Life will. So Lord, as we marinate in that for a while this morning, I pray that it would stir our soul, that it would nudge us closer to you, Father. We come in bearing all sorts of grief and hurts and hang-ups and just the stuff that we carry around in life, and I pray that this morning we could lay that at your feet, Father, and worship you freely. We can cast aside all those things, not that they will disappear, but we can hand them to you knowing and trusting that in your great faithfulness you will help us, that you will come alongside us, that you will speak to our hearts and remind us of your grace and your mercy. And so today, on this day of celebration, we proclaim with you your victory. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. From the voiceless dark I could hear you call my name to a world apart, to a life of love away with a beating heart and a simple sighted faith safe within your arms, quiet by the light of grace. There in the cradle of life, you held my breath. Here at the table of wine and broken bread, I find all I need. You are all I need. In the air I breathe, in the joy of being hidden in your time until the life ahead. You are all. sacred voice singing purpose into place even in the void in the sudden wake of pain when the shadows join still I'm in the light of grace there in the waves of this life you hold my breath
hands if you're here and they know what to do. Meet your teachers at the back. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and get those out. Turn with me to the Gospel of of John. And and while all of this is happening, I just want to say welcome. So glad that you are here with us today. I uh, trust you, maybe you picked up a bulletin on the way in. I'm not going to read through all the announcements. They're there, and, and you can see them. Um, if you are curious about giving to the ministries of our church, we have little black boxes at the back of the worship center and, and in the lobby. Um, and also you can, can donate online. Well, man, it's just been a holy moment this morning. Has it not? And I was wondering, uh, could I have your permission? Could I read you a resurrection story? Would that be okay on on Easter Sunday? I successfully made it all the way through the morning without somebody telling me, hey, pastor, you know what? This is kind of like your Super Bowl. I'm like, I get it. I know it's Easter Sunday. But you know what? We actually gather in this place week after week, Sunday after Sunday. And you know what? We celebrate the resurrection every day single Sunday. Today it just is a little bit extra special because on the calendar of the church we go through Holy Week and we went through a beautiful Good Friday service, but then we get to today and all the lights seem to come on and the tomb is empty. So that's a spoiler alert. The story that I'm going to read for you, it didn't change from last year. So we're in the Gospel of John in uh, chapter 20 and he tells the story like this. He says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and he bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Of course, that's Peter, right? He just barges right in. And he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside, and see, he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On that same evening of that first day of the week, When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. We say thanks be to God. I told you it ends the same way, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> and when I'm, I come to these passages and study them and read them over and over in, in preparation, and it's really a story that it tells itself. We've heard message after message probably on, on this passage and It shows really the stages of people, followers of Jesus, who were moving from their fear to a deeper point in their faith. It starts off, while it was still dark, Mary went out to the tomb. While it was still dark, it's it's before dawn, it's it's a metaphor of, of the whole human sinful condition and, and Jesus' followers at this point, they, they think he's dead. They think he's cold uh, in the, in, you know, locked up in, in that tomb on, on that slab of, of rock. That's where they left him on Friday. But, but Jesus has this bad little habit of escaping every tomb that we seem to put him in. <laughs> and he reveals himself to his followers. Dawn begins to break. Light starts to happen. While it was still dark, now Jesus is revealing himself, and now the light is dawning, and he just starts showing up and reminding them, remember, I told you about this. We talked about the resurrection. It's all true. I want to talk to you. I, I don't have a lot of fancy slides this morning. That's the only one you get to see today. So I want you to listen If you need to scribble some some things down, um, go for it. But I want to talk to you this morning about chasing the wild goose. And we'll get to that in a little bit. A couple other things have been on my mind as I was reading this story over and over and over this week. I was impressed with all of the running in the story. Did, Did you notice that? There's people running everywhere. Mary ran from the empty tomb. She ran back to Peter and to John and told them the news. And in kind of a state of disbelief, they're like, no way. And she says, way. And they go running off to the tomb, both of them, Peter and John. They have this little discipleship rivalry going on. And so we see that they're in a foot race here. And maybe Peter got the jump on John when he's going, but, you know, John... And he's the storyteller here, and he has to tell us that (laughs) Peter didn't get there first. (laughs) I outran. Peter might have the keys to the kingdom of heaven, but I'm faster. (laughs) And so they go running back out to the tomb, and I bet when they get there, they're out of breath. Did you notice that when John gets to the tomb, he he bent over and looked in? Do you think he was curious, or do you think he was just flat out of breath? (laughs) (laughs) I beat that guy, but man, I think I'm going to die right now. And then along comes Peter. He he catches up, and I can just see him pulling in. He's gasping for breath. He's huffing and puffing. He's looking around for the oxygen mask on the sideline, and he says, give me some of that oxygen before I I collapse. Can, Can you think of a time when you were just out of breath? Just think for a moment. The one time in your life where you just didn't feel like you had any physical air in your lungs. I, I was thinking about it. I remember skating wind sprints at hockey practice. Except my coaches, they didn't call them wind sprints. They called them killers. And the killer in ice hockey is you start 
on one end at the red line and then you skate as fast as you can to the blue line and then you skate back and then you skate out to the middle to the red line and then you skate all the way back to the end and then you skate all the way to the other blue line and back and then you skate all the way to the other end of the ice to that red line and all the way back as fast as you can and it is a race and that's one. All right, kids, give me 10 killers. It wins you. No breath when you're done with that. You know, when we think about breathing, most of us, we take our breath for granted, right? I mean, we don't, we don't think about it. We're not conscious of it unless we can't breathe. And then, <laughs> when we can't breathe, and you don't have any wind, no, no oxygen in your lungs, then there's this momentary panic mode that seems to set in. I remember a time on the playground, I think maybe it was fourth grade, and we had this, con we had always had little contests on the playground, and this, the contest of this day was, uh, we had these, this long set of monkey bars, and the contest of the day was, who can skip the most rungs going across the monkey bars? And I remember well, I, I remember, and then I don't remember, because I went as far as I could, and I reached, and my hand just didn't quite get it, and <laughs> fell flat on my back, and totally knocked the wind out of me. And you, you know, so you're, you're laying on the ground in a situation like this, you get, maybe you get punched in the gut, maybe you fall off the monkey bars, whatever it might be, you're laying there, and you're like, I didn't think it was going to end this way. <laughs> Man, I had a good run. It's fourth grade, but... You know, you, it, you, your life flashes before your eyes when you have zero breath, right? The more I read this story, the more I believe that the crucifixion, that after the crucifixion, the disciples felt like they had had the wind knocked out of them. Like they fell off the monkey bars when they saw Jesus dead on the cross and then in the tomb on that slab and the stone rolled into place. I bet they felt like they had no wind, no oxygen. They took a gut punch and oof. Now what do we do? Now what? Life hits you hard sometimes, right? It just does. It knocks the breath out of us. Maybe it's that late night call and, and you know something terribly bad has happened. Or, or maybe it's when you're, in, when you're in that little room and they say the doctor's going to be with you in just a little bit and you, whether there's a clock in the room or not, you can just hear that tick, 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 and time just seems to stand still. And then the door opens, there might be some eye contact, and then the, the door just closes slowly, and you just know it's not good news. Or your boss calls you in. You get let, laid off, or let go, and, and you have that long walk, and you, I don't know what I'm going to tell, I don't know what I'm going to tell my family. Or you get hit with unexpected things in life that just come up. And when these things happen, it feels like we take a gut punch. It feels like we just are a little bit short of grabbing that rung and we fall flat on our back and there's no wind, there's no oxygen, there's no breath and we wonder, what are we going to do now? Lisa and I were in the car yesterday driving and we were listening to um, a book written by the, the lead singer of U2, uh, Bono. The book is called Surrender. Chapter 22, he tells the story of uh, their bass player. His name's Adam. And Adam um, got caught up in some bad habits. And there was one night they were they were just getting ready to open a tour 
in Australia. And at soundcheck, and this was going to be a televised thing, soundcheck, somebody crosses the stage and whispers into Bono's ear, uh, Adam's not going to make it. It's like, well, we can have somebody stand in for sound check and we'll catch him up to speed before we go live tonight. And I'm like, no, you, you don't understand. He's not going to make it tonight. He had partied way too hard the night before. And he didn't make it for that show. And Bono tells the story that this was a, one of those moments where he, he recognized his difficulty. He recognized, man, I just fell off the monkey bars and I've got nothing. And the way that my life is going right now, Bono is a, a spiritual guy um, and, and he's like, but Adam, he just pushed back on all of our religious stuff until that moment. And he's lying there flat on the ground, no breath. This is, this is the bottom. And Bono told the story of how the other three bandmates got on their knees with him. And the book's called Surrender. And that's the story that gave the book its title. Because we all are going to come to a moment when we get to the end of ourself, when, when we fall off the monkey bars and we have zero oxygen, zero breath, whatever it is that put us in that spot, we're going to realize that I can't do this on my own and we're going to reach out. You've got to surrender and give your life over to this person named Jesus. To the disciples, they were just out of breath, reeling, staggering, gasping, Verse 19, John said that on the same evening, I mean, they were, they were so lost in this moment that they were together and that they were in this room and the doors were locked because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They didn't know what to do next because they had just taken the gut punch and they didn't have any breath and they didn't know what to do and they're exhausted and they're overwhelmed and, and they were in possession of the good news, right? Mary had come and, and, and told them, Everything that she had seen, everything that she had heard, I saw Jesus. He's alive. They had that news, and yet they struggled with it. And they were there, huddled in fear, just paralyzed. See, because when you don't have breath, you don't have life. And I sense that some of us in this room this morning are living out of breath lives. You feel like the wind has just been knocked out of you and you can't breathe and you don't have strength and you're gasping for air and you don't know what to do and when you're out of breath you don't really live life to the fullest. But friends, I got to remind you, you were made you're made to breathe. While the disciples were gathered, hiding in that locked room, just when they thought that they were going to suffocate and be no more, just when they felt like they had no breath and the life that they were hoping for with Jesus that was just kind of ebbing away from them, Jesus shows up. And he had told them he wasn't going to leave them alone. In John, a little bit earlier, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you all alone. And there he is. He shows up. And he shows up for you. In all of those dark places where, where it feels like you have no air to breathe, in those moments when, when the wind is knocked out of you, when you fall off the monkey bars, Jesus shows up. And he will search you out and he will take the initiative to come and find you. See, Jesus showed up and he spoke the peace of God into their lives. Twice he said it. He spoke peace into their lives so that they could have peace with God in the midst of their, of their fear. As their lives were just unraveling in, in front of them and falling apart, Jesus spoke this word of peace. And what I want you to notice today is that John also says he breathed. He breathed on them. 
The, the Greek word there in John is, is it's a fun one to say. Uh, it's, it's empusaho. Empusaho. You can say that. It's fun to say. It won't hurt you. It's breath. Empusaho means to puff or, or to breathe. Now think back. Where else have we seen God's breath in Scripture? You go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, I think it's verse 7. It says that God formed mankind from the dust of the ground and he breathed into our nostrils what? The breath of life. And God filled your lungs with the breath of life and, and he continues to breathe life into you. you you're not going to suffocate even when life throws the best gut punch it has at you. God breathes life back into you because you were made to breathe. You were made to live. You, you may be skeptical, skeptical and say, well, you know what? I, I don't know, Pastor. How? 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 How does that work? Well, I've got, I've got some good news and, and some bad news. I always like getting the bad news out of the way first. The bad news is you can't breathe the first breath of new life on your own. You can't breathe the first breath of new life on your own. When God created Adam... Adam couldn't take his first breath on his own. God initiated that. God breathed life into Adam. So all you can do, friends, is open yourself. Open your, your throat. Open your nostrils. Open your heart to the breath of God. See, the good news is that in Jesus, God has breathed and offers you the breath of life so that you can live as God made you to live. Now, remember that Jesus went around and he was, he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And as he breathed out on the disciples, he said, what did he say? He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they could feel their own lungs fill up as they breathed in what Jesus was breathing out, what their fear had killed in them, what, what their fear had stolen from them, what their fear had knocked out of them. Jesus' breath brought it back to life. Jesus breathes out the same Spirit upon you. And that's the good news, right? He moves over the chaos of your life. He moves in the dark places. He, he offers you his resurrecting breath. And my question is, would, would you breathe that in? I'm a C.S. Lewis fan. Last year I went through the Chronicles of, of Narnia again. And I always love the imagery. Um, and, and this story reminds me of it where the, the great lion, Aslan, at the end of the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when a bunch of the, the good characters had been petrified, turned to stone, lifeless, cold beings with no breath by, by the white witch, the, the adversary there. Um, there's this moment where Aslan goes, initiates, right? He comes and finds us. He goes to where they are arranged in a cemetery kind of like setting, right? And Aslan starts walking around and he breathes on them. And Pusaho. And what was stone, what was cold, what was lifeless, begins to warm and reanimate. He breathes on them the breath of life and restores them. And that's another word for God's breath the Holy Spirit. Not a ghost, not an idea, not a thing. The Holy Spirit is the moving, empowering, activating, life-giving breath of God. So I wanted to leave you with, with one more image this morning. 
I, I told you that I wanted to talk to you about chasing the wild goose. Figured we probably better get back to that, right? I know it doesn't sound very Easterish, but I'm fascinated by uh, what the Celtic Christians call the Holy Spirit. They have a description for the Holy Spirit, a name, uh, uh, if you will, and they call him the Anagatagloss. Anagatagloss, which means wild goose. Now, the Hebrew word for breath, for wind, is the Hebrew word ruach. It's another fun one to say, because you have to say it just right. It's not just ruach with a hard K. You got to have the, because it means breath, because it means wind. You have to have that wind just kind of go linger over your vocal cords. It's like saying my last name traditionally in German, Bach. It's the Ruach. That's how you say it. It's the breath of God. It means wind. But it also means, it's not just wind itself. It, it's moving air. And the moving is, is really important because it is the motion that actually does something with air. The in and out, in and out. You can't just have breath, you can't just have wind without it having motion, right? And God sets the breath into motion, into rhythm. We breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe out. It's not stagnant. It doesn't grow stale. God breathes. God's breath is fresh. God's breath is purifying. And when I think about wind, it's, it's not very predictable, right? If, if, you, if you go anywhere around here, this time of year, there's a breeze. There's wind. And it's not predictable. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know where it's going. Quite frankly, I don't like it. It could be just a soft, gentle breeze, or it could be the gale force. You know what? I mean, you live here. You get it. Wind is not predictable. And Jesus is not tameable, just like the wind is not tameable. Jesus refuses to stay in the tombs we put him in. and He's out there moving. He's out there working. And, and so I love the description of the Holy Spirit as the wild goose because like the wind is unpredictable, it's untamable. We can't control the wind. We might be able to harness it for our benefit a little bit, but we can't control it or contain it. Just like that, the, you can't predict, you can't tame, you can't control the Holy Spirit. Just like a wild goose. Have you ever tried to tame a wild goose? Have you ever been chased by a wild goose? <laughs> During the week, the Canadian geese, they love our parking lot. You know this sometimes. And sometimes I park out there, and the geese look at me like, what are you doing today? You're not going into that building. And they, you know, they come after you, and... When I was smaller, it was a little bit more intimidating. Now I just look at them and, you know, like, you'd look really good on my table. No, I know you can't do that. You can't do that around here. I know. Well, other places in the country, you can have goose for dinner. Anyway, I digress here. <laughs> Point is, geese are unpredictable, aren't they? <laughs> you have no idea what they're going to do. They go where they want. They're not tame. They have this element of mysteriousness, a danger about them, but also of adventure and of freedom. I uh, didn't sleep much last night. I got up really early this morning, and I went down to the Windpoint Lighthouse while it was still dark. And I sat there on a rock, and I listened to the waves crashing the shore, and I watched the sun come up. And while I was there, I lost count of how many birds and ducks and geese flew overhead. I'm, I got lost in wondering, I wonder where they're going. The kind of adventures that they find themselves on. You see, you can't tame the Holy Spirit 
He comes in power. He'll disturb your status quo. He will breathe new life into your empty lungs, and he will send you out into a new adventure with God. And when, when Jesus finds you, and you give your life to him, and he, and he breathes out his spirit on you, when you find yourself lying flat on the ground because you missed the rung on the monkey bar, and you don't know what's coming next, and you surrender in that moment, he'll fill you with his breath. I've been a Christian for 46 years. That's a long time. Because I'm only 47. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. Uh, and I'll be honest, there are ups and downs in the life of faith. But I think that it's really appropriate to say that life in the Spirit is kind of like a wild goose chase. Now, I know, um, when we talk about being on a wild goose chase, we're, we're usually talking about trying to do something that seems to lead us in circles and doesn't have a clearly defined ending or purpose, but how I'm talking about this, the wild goose chase is something that's unpredictable and has an element of adventure in it. When we follow the Holy Spirit, we might not always know exactly what's going on, <laughs> we might not know exactly where he is leading us because he's going to take you to places that you maybe have never even imagined and he's going to have you following paths that you never even knew existed doing things that you didn't even know were possible see friends christianity isn't about giving your life over to something that's sealed up in a tomb that is dead and cold and lifeless and has no breath to give Christianity is, is not about knowing a lot of facts and information. Christianity is it's about knowing a person, a real life, God, the living God, who has breath to give. It's the person of Jesus. It, it's not about rule-keeping and following a checklist to stay in the good graces of God, it's about following Jesus on his mission out in the world, living for him, living with him. Christianity is about God's breath through Christ in you. And he shows up, and you're laying there on the ground. No breath. And he says, peace. Peace be with you. And he breathes on you the breath of life. And he says, receive. Receive the Spirit. And he gives you new life. And he fills you with the power of the Holy Spirit to uphold you and sustain you and walk with you through all the trouble that we will encounter in this life. Christianity is about a God who breathes it's about a wind blowing in our life and affecting every single thing that we do. And so I just wonder, has the wind been knocked out of you? Are you walking through life right now and do you feel breathless? Would you say that you could characterize your life as an out-of-breath life? So I wonder, do you need the Lord's breath today? Would you let God breathe this new life and his power into you? Would you receive his free gift of forgiveness and salvation and his Holy Spirit. Can I just invite you to join the wild goose chase? And if this is a gift that you want, I invite you to receive it today. To, to deal with the stuff that you know is in your life that we call sin. Would you admit that before God and allow him to cleanse you and 
purify you and make you ready to follow him into the future that he wants for you. Would you stand? Let's, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the breath that you breathe into us. We thank you that you did not leave your disciples <laughs> huddling in that room alone and paralyzed and in fear with no breath. You searched them out when they were at their lowest moment and you brought the peace of God with you so that they could be at peace with God. We thank you that you do the same thing for us when our lives feel chaotic and, and out of control, like we have no peace in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the peace of the Father that you bring us. But you just didn't bring peace. You, you breathed on them the breath of life, the breath of new life. Where they were running and hiding in fear. You breathe that new life of power back into them so that they could go forth from that place and get back to the mission that you had set in front of them. So Lord, I pray for my friends here this morning. Maybe there's some who are just struggling through life. Maybe it's an event that has happened that's left them feeling breathless. Maybe it's a collection of a life's worth of decisions that have not been healthy. And they recognize that there's a barrier between them and you. It's called sin. And I pray this morning, Lord, that they would repent of that and call on you for forgiveness. And Lord, we thank you that on Friday you hung on that cross to pay the penalty for our sin so that as we ask for forgiveness today, it's already been paid for. It's totally free. So we ask, Lord, would you forgive us? Would you come and be our Lord? Would you come and save us? Would you come and breathe the breath of new life in us? Transform us, we pray. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together.
because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know Tell somebody about that. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday.